you. It's uh, an honor and privilege to, to be here today and uh, yeah, that's okay. be able to introduce our, our speaker. Uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, is uh, the National Secretary and the Chief Executive Officer of Phi Beta Kappa. Um, and that is uh, a very distinguished company that he leads. Uh, I think 10% of the universities have a chapter, uh, only four in Michigan, and we're blessed to have one right here on this campus. I think that is a reflection of the quality of the education uh, and our commitment uh, to uh, liberal arts. Uh, liberal arts, uh, arts and science education, uh, which is the foundation, the bedrock of becoming a learned man and woman. Uh, and a global citizen. Uh, the notion that you need to understand both the sciences, be they natural, biological, physical, as well as humanities, as well as social sciences, to be a rounded, learned citizen, uh, I think is foundational to what we are as a campus, foundational to what we're building as we revise our curriculum, uh, maintaining that, that commitment. And Phi Beta Kappa recognizes and acknowledges those students who have achieved uh, distinction in that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a member of Phi Beta Kappa, and Fred hasn't offered to make me one. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, uh, I recognize the honor and the privilege uh, of the society. Uh, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about Fred uh, himself. Uh, obviously, uh, not only is he the, the tenth secretary of, of Phi Beta Kappa, uh, he has been an attorney. Uh, he's been a scholar. He's an author. He's a public intellectual. He's uh, led institutions. He was the president of Brandeis. He's been a dean at George Washington University. He's been a colleague uh, at Georgetown University. Uh, and in all those appointments, he brings uh, a real clarity of thought, a really razor sharp mind to his analysis of the public sphere and what you operate in. And the conversation he's going to lead us through today is one that we need. I grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, and if you turn on the news, you understand that we as a society are grappling with, uh, with hatred and ability to talk to each other, to communicate with each other, even when there are differences. Uh, and so we need to figure out a better way, other than shooting and killing each other, to have conversation, to communicate, to deal with uh, our neighbors. Uh, and we at universities uh, are not immune from those problems. We have those, had those challenges. We've had those challenges on campuses. We have those challenges in making sure that we as citizens uh, could go out in that world. And Fred has been one of the experts uh, in having those hard conversations. But sometimes they are hard conversations. There are fundamental differences in values or, or perspectives. Uh, but we must find a way uh, to be able to uh, agree to disagree. Agree to disagree, uh, even when they're they're deep and fundamental. And so, uh, his coming, his talk for today is uh, very much spot on, very much uh, what we need. And he, I can't think of a better national expert than Fred to deliver today's address. So, with that, good luck. Thank you all uh, for two warm introductions, and I will just take a a brief, friendly amendment uh, to both both introductions. First, to uh, your president, and you are very fortunate to have a dedicated, committed, gifted, gifted servant of his country in government, uh, and now in the university, and my friend uh, Ed Montgomery. And the only small edit I would make to your <laughs> kind remarks is that you're not a member of Phi Beta Kappa so far. <laughs> As they say in New Jersey, I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> And we'll let that sink in a little bit. Um, uh, and Molly, thank you for making this day happen and for your, your kind uh, role in all of this. And so my friendly amendment to your generous introduction, uh, the, the motto of Phi Beta Kappa, from which we yield our initials, Philosophia, Philosophia Bio Kubernetes. Uh, anybody take any Greek in this room? Oh, good, then I can make it up. Um, <laughs> Uh, we usually translate it as love of learning is the guide of life. But Kubernetes, which actually has the root for governor in it, uh, Kubernetes actually in classical Greek has a nautical or marine connotation. So in fact, a slightly better translation than the one we typically use would be love of learning is the helmsman of life or the pilot of life. And there's a subtle but significant difference, I think. The, the guide, after all, takes you on a path that already exists. The helmsman or the pilot 
steers you out into the water where there is no path. And sometimes the waters are choppy, like the times in which we're living. And the founders of Phi Beta Kappa, who were five young people, just like you, living in turbulent times, just like yours, unsure of how it was all going to come out. And on the cold winter night of December 5th, 1776, of all things, they committed themselves to the notion that the love of learning would be the helmsman of life. It is astonishing, really, and inspirational, and it inspires still. The values that go back to that founding night and that have animated Phi Beta Kappa for the past near quarter millennium include a deep commitment to free expression, free inquiry, academic freedom, values that bring us here tonight. But before I turn to free expression per se, uh, I cannot help but be moved by Ed's comments of coming from Pittsburgh and the events that we have lived through as a country, as a people, for the last few days. Um, you know, my own career uh, got me into the area of free expression, perhaps ironically, uh, as a secondary focus. My original scholarly focus was in the area of hate crimes, bias-motivated violence. Before I became a, pro a, a professor, I was a assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, and I was the chief of the civil rights unit of that office. So I was engaged first in the practice of, and then in the study of the prosecution of bias-motivated crimes, racially motivated, misogynistically motivated, homophobic crimes, religiously motivated crimes. Um, there was an article I wrote uh, dealing with some of the theoretical issues of criminal punishment of bias motivated crimes and I dropped a footnote in it that the scholars in the room will understand is the kind of footnote that eventually comes back and spawns the next project. It was a footnote uh, that said, I put to one side for the moment the issue of whether or not hate crimes in fact are unconstitutional because they punish thought, not criminal behavior, which many people had said, and that somebody ought to write an article about that at some point. So I figure that ought to be me. So that, was, turn, that footnote turned into a, a different article that actually put me in the free expression space. And those are the things I'll talk about at somewhat greater length tonight. But I do think we should pause for a moment on what happened in Pittsburgh, and not just Pittsburgh. Over the same weekend, what happened in Kentucky to African Americans committing the crime of shopping in public as African Americans, that's all. And 11 Jewish Americans in synagogue committing the crime of being Jewish and in public, in their private prayer space actually, not even public. Why does that hit us differently? And I will now, if you'll permit me, summarize what could be a different hour lecture. The, fight me back, Ed, we'll do it another time. Um, God, I hope it all becomes obsolete and there's nothing more to talk about in this, actually. That's my dearest hope, that my field would just disappear. Um, not, not yet, huh? Not yet. Um, there are the argument for the enhanced punishment of bias-motivated violence that I and others were involved in, and I'm proud to say not only in scholarship, but in work that ultimately took me before Congress on several occasions testifying before federal hate crimes legislation, and I am particularly proud that I was one of those who was involved in what ultimately became the 2009 uh, Hate Crimes Prevention Act, known more frequently as the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Act. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, when President Obama signed that uh, in 2009, uh, mine were not the only eyes that were moist in that room. That legislation began life in the early 1990s and never got passed until then. The argument for treating hate crimes differently can be summarized briefly, and this is not the full hour-long lecture, obviously, but briefly by noting that there are three different levels in which hate crimes affect us, which makes them different from crimes that, although similar, in many ways lack the bias motivation. One is the harm to the individual, which is not just the harm of the crime, but a kind of spirit murdering that happens at the same time because you're not just a victim because of where you are, but because of who you are. And you are singled out and chosen because of who you are. The second level is the impact it has on the target community and the proof of the impact it will have on the target community for anybody who cares to do so. Ask any 
Jewish American next Saturday who is in a synagogue any place in this country or chooses not to go to synagogue next Saturday and she or he will tell you that they are responding to what happened in Pittsburgh. And the odd piece of this, I don't mean odd in a trivial way, is that members of the target community behave not just in a sense of empathy for the victims. I mean, any thinking, caring person has empathy for victims of a crime. And not just sympathy in the sense of, you know, I, I feel for them, what they felt. But literally, studies show that they behave with the same pattern of victimology as the actual victim of the crime, as if they themselves were victims, because they were. So the target community is affected as well. And then third, obviously, but it bears repetition, it affects the whole community. There's a reason we all felt what happened in Pittsburgh and what happened in Kentucky so deeply. Because this is, at essence, a multicultural society, has been from the beginning, executed incompletely to be sure. The challenge that our founders gave us was to form a more perfect union. That is a job before us every day. Not there yet, to say the least. And we are knit together, a community of communities, and certain crimes tear at those lines where we are knit together. Those fissure lines, those split lines. And when those happen, we feel it as a community most acutely. So the argument for the enhanced punishment of bias motivated violence has been that the harm that is intended and is accomplished is actually is a deeper and a greater harm than other similar crimes but with bias motivation. Now the argument that is made against the hate crime project is that it is about punishing thought, not punishing criminal behavior. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But I will tell you for now that that argument, which looked for a little bit as if the Supreme Court was going to accept it, a case in 1992 involving the cross-burning ordinance in St. Paul, Minnesota, which was struck down on the argument that you cannot single out certain kinds of motivations as opposed to others. Now, for many of us in the Hate Crimes Project, this looked like it was a serious problem for effectuating what we were working on. And if I may be perfectly parochial and personal, this happened two years before I came up for tenure, and I was watching my whole field get declared unconstitutional. <laughs> so this was personal. Two years later, fortunately, the Supreme Court, in a case called Wisconsin against Mitchell, upheld the Wisconsin bias crime law, a law that said that if certain enumerated crimes are committed with bias motivation, they would be punished at a higher level because of the, the greater harm. So we'll have occasion to come back to Wisconsin and Mitchell a little later on. Let's turn now more directly to the question of free speech on campus. Here are the two things I've observed talking all over the country about the challenges of free expression on campus. One, vast majority of people see this as important, significant, complex, nuanced set of questions. Two, most people are scared to death to talk about it because you feel as if you can get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, you are, well, you're defending the right of somebody to speak and therefore you must agree with that person's substantive points. Or you're insensitive to the feelings of others. Or you're insensitive to the role of free expression. So I cannot tell you how many audiences I've been in where what people have said afterwards is, you know, I just, I, I'm glad you talked about it, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna get hurt. You know, I just don't wanna touch that stove. I get it. Well, I am motivated by one of the great figures in the life of Phi Beta Kappa, the great Ralph Waldo Emerson, who um, among the great inspirations in his life was his aunt, Mary Moody, who famously told him, do the thing you fear to do. And Emerson said that always motivated him. So uh, when I have trouble screwing my courage to the sticking point, as the poet said, I think of Aunt Mary Moody saying, do the thing you fear to do. So here it goes. When we talk about free expression on campus, and some of what I'll say would apply generally out into society, but for our purposes, let's focus on campus. There's a reason this is hard. 
because we are at the conflict point between two of the core values of what any institution is about, but particularly a liberal arts institution and particularly one with a strong residential component. We are, on one hand, involved in the creation and discovery of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge through teaching and scholarship and learning. And we're involved in building a community, and not just a community for these years that you're here, but I'm sure as Ed tells you on a regular basis, wherever you go and for the rest of your life. Isn't that right, Ed? That is correct. And it's never about giving money to the university, it's about showing their appreciation, but we all know how we show our appreciation, don't we? So it is about building community, and it is about sharing ideas. And those two sets of values don't always fit together so well. So it's not surprising that it's a challenge. And when these issues come up, whether it's about outside speakers who are controversial, whether it's about inside the community, people who share provocative ideas, troublesome ideas, yes, hateful ideas, things that people say by accident, things that people say on purpose. When these ideas come up, courtesy of the time in which we are living, they often go viral. And when they go viral, it is very hard to think clearly as a community. And so for people who like to make decisions by figuring out which way the wind is blowing, this is a bad area. Because when these issues come, I can tell you right now what direction the wind is blowing from. 360. And I can tell you how fast it's blowing. Gale force. So the only way to think about these issues productively, I think, is not in the middle of a crisis, but in a lovely setting like this, where you can take notes and I can talk extemporaneously and it's all being recorded for the record. <laughs> and we can work out first principles that ought to govern how we think about these issues. I, I am not here to suggest to you, and here's how Western ought to deal with this in every case. I am not confident on all the answers to these questions, but I'm fairly confident that these are the right questions. And this is the way to think about these issues. And that one has to think about first by core value of the institution. And that's why I describe it as the creation and discovery of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge through our teaching, our scholarship, our studying, for the betterment of our local communities, our national communities, and even aspirationally our international community. And your mission may not be precisely that, but it's some cousin of that. It's some variation of that. And if that is the mission of a great liberal arts university, then the need for full, robust, free expression, free inquiry, those are not two ways of saying the same thing, and academic freedom, and that's not a third way of saying the same thing, they're all related values, but they're somewhat different, is absolutely core to achieving that mission of the creation and discovery of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge. We must be free to express our views, particularly in a state university where the First Amendment of the Constitution does apply, not in any theoretical way, but literally, legally. I would be making a similar argument in a private university, by the way. I would just be deriving these principles from the core values of a liberal arts and science tradition, not specifically from the First Amendment. In this case, I think it, it is both. The obligation, really, to communicate and to, to be part of this discussion is core to the enterprise of how we relate in a self-governing society and on campus in this business of creating and discovering knowledge. Free inquiry, I said, is slightly different because free inquiry is the business of being able to ask questions not sure where they're going. I asked the students in particular in the room, if you ever had the feeling of you, you start to ask a question and you think, no, that's not right. Yeah, but you didn't know it wasn't right till you started asking the question. Or for the students or the faculty in the room, the experience of you don't know that an idea doesn't work till you try to write it. What about question marks? That's okay. <laughs> That's a, you know, Siri can jump in any time. It's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Um, 
So the, uh, you know, we're on the record here. It's fine. Um, the judge for whom I was privileged to clerk had an expression that she would use that we don't know if this idea is right until we see if it writes that way. And I remember one time I did a draft opinion for her. I worked very hard on it, and I thought it was a pretty good draft. And she called me into her side of chambers, and she said that this was a terrific draft and really well, well done. I was getting all pumped up, you know? Um, and then she said, and we're not going to use a word of it. <laughs> um, it took me a while to figure out why that was a compliment. Um, what she said was, I didn't know this wasn't the right way to go about it till I saw that we couldn't write it that way. Right? That experience of trying an idea out to see if it works is so important to the advancement of knowledge. If all your ideas are good ideas, you don't have enough ideas. It means you have self-censored some of the ones that were kind of your wacky ones, most of which, by the way, were wacky ones, <laughs> and they do wind up on the floor. Oh, but some of them weren't the wacky ones. Some of them turn out to be the best ones that you never would have gotten to, but for robust free inquiry. So it's essential to have that in a liberal arts institution. So what's the first principle that we glean from all this? We glean a concept that speech, expression, writings are presumed to be protected. That is to say, speakers are presumed to be entitled to speak. Ideas are entitled, presumed to be entitled to be communicated. Written words are presumed to be entitled to be published. And if that's all there were to it, then the title of this talk would have been Free Expression on Campus. It's easy. <laughs> but that's not the title of the talk. It's Free Expression on Campus. It's complicated. Because that's not all there is to it. We sense in a university setting that, of course, there are limitations on speech. So how do we think about setting those limitations on speech? Let me start, if you will, down a blind alley that's worth pursuing to see why it's a blind alley. There's that free inquiry stuff again. But also because it's a theory that has got a lot of currency. And as a matter of fact, it comes up in no lesser place than the Supreme Court of the United States and in precisely the case I told you that upheld bias crimes, Wisconsin against Mitchell. What did the Supreme Court say in Wisconsin against Mitchell? It said the reason the Wisconsin hate crime law was constitutional, whereas the St. Paul, Minnesota cross-burning ordinance was not constitutional, was that the St. Paul ordinance punished thought or speech or expression. Can't do that. The Wisconsin statute punished conduct. And that you can do. This is known as a speech conduct distinction. It's a very tempting distinction because it appears to give us a bright line. We must protect speech for all the reasons I just talked about. That's our first principle, after all, presumption of protecting speech. And we, can, we may regulate conduct. Right? This is the idea that says that my right to express myself right, ends where it bumps into you. I can swing my hand, but if I bump into you, now I've interfered with you, and that's now conduct that can be regulated. I could actually be punished for that, certainly disciplined within a university. Uh, that's fine. There's only one problem with this. It doesn't work. Let's see why. Suppose that at this point in the talk, one of you had just about had enough. And so you decided to make a sign, come up here and stand right next to me with a sign that said, Lawrence is full of cold tea. <laughs> or perhaps stronger words. But this is Michigan and you're nice, right? <laughs> so is that speech or is that conduct? How many people say it's speech? Oh, by the way, this is Albanian rules. Everybody has to vote. <laughs> I don't know if those are still the laws in Albania, but they used to be, and they're, they're good ones. So how many people think it's speech? Hmm, looks like just about a half. How many think it's conduct? Also just about a half. And the answer, of course, is you're both right. right? It, it is probably best described by the generic term expressive behavior. It's all expressive behavior. What I'm doing right now is expressive behavior behavior. Holding up a sign is expressive behavior. Whether the behavior involves words or not does not really seem to be the critical piece here. So trying to separate speech from conduct 
looks as if it's going to be a full zeroing. But let's play, spend just a little more time on this with the court. One of the classic places where the court has done this is one you'd know very well, I suspect. That is a series of Supreme Court cases that have held that there is a constitutional right to burn a flag. I'm not a big fan of burning flags myself. I don't advise it. Um, but it is protected under the First Amendment, and I think it should be. And even as the Supreme Court has become more conservative in a number of areas, it has consistently upheld the right to burn an American flag. Why? On what ground? It's expressive behavior, right? It's expression. It's not conduct. Okay? All good so far? Good. Now, let's go back a little bit. There's a case in the 1960s that will be of particular interest and relevance to the men in the room of my age or older because it involves something called a draft card. All right, once upon a time, not so very long ago, all young men were required to register for the draft by the time they turned 18, and from the time they were 18 to the time they were 26, had to carry with you a draft card. It was actually a federal law that you had to have your draft card on you when you registered for the selective service. All right, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right, and you had to, among other things, you went through a draft lottery. Any, any one of you guys, if you can remember your draft lottery number, right? Mine was 86, right? Somebody got a number back there? 12. Yeah, you never, 12. 12. Nine. Nine. <laughs> Nine. Nine. We are not worthy. Okay. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, actually, you're perfectly worthy. You know, who's, you know who we're really not worthy for? Your parents who lived through you getting the nine draft number. Okay, this is what we lived through. So, that's the reason that burning draft cards was such a potent symbol of opposition to the Vietnam War, because it was a law that you had to carry a draft card. But it turns out there wasn't just a law about carrying a draft card. <coughs> there was also a law that you couldn't destroy a draft card, two different laws. So Mr. O'Brien decided to burn his draft card in public. He was, as he hoped, prosecuted for burning a draft card in public. Why did he hope to be prosecuted for that? Because he wanted to challenge the constitutionality of the law. So he did challenge the constitutionality of it. Now, if you were representing Mr. O'Brien, what would you argue? I, I would, by the way, the, the questions do get harder, so if I were you, I'd grab one of these easy ones. Um, so uh, what would you argue, just based on the constitutional law we've been talking about, not all that much? Somebody. Expressive behavior. Expressive behavior, right, and what cases would you cite? The flag burning. The flag burning. You'd say burning a draft card is like burning a flag, just the same way burning a flag is expressive behavior, burning a draft card is expressive behavior, therefore it should be protected, right? No! No, the court says absolutely not. It's conduct. It can be regulated. It can be prohibited. It can be criminalized. Famous Law Review article about that case by a great scholar by the name of John Hart Ely said that the problem with the speech conduct distinction became really apparent there. He said it's not just that you can't distinguish speech from conduct, it's that acts like draft card burning, like flag burning, like the Lawrence is full of cold tea. <clears throat> they are, speech and conduct are inextricably connected. You can't even separate them. It's incoherent to talk about them. Here is Ely's famous formulation. The best way to understand these things, they are 100% speech and 100% conduct, which was kind of your intuition when I asked for your, for your votes. So if that's not going to work, what might? Because the problem here is what philosophers would call a tautology or what others might just call putting the rabbit in the hat before you pull the rabbit out of the hat. Put differently, that which we wish to protect, we will call speech. That which we wish to regulate, we will call conduct. But it completely assumes its own conclusion. Right? Not only is that intellectually incoherent, but imagine a dean of students trying to advise students on what they may or may not do. There's no predictability. Instead, we might take a page out of, of all places, criminal law, but stay with me. One of the things we focus on in the criminal law all the time is the mental state of the actor. Mental state of the actor is what makes the difference between <coughs> a crime and different levels of crime, murder, manslaughter, negligent homicide, all the differences about what's in the actor's mind. Let's try the following hypothetical. Suppose I tell you that one person takes a bat, swings it hard, intentionally, hits somebody in the head very hard, person passes out, concusses afterwards, huge welt on the person's head, a lot of blood loss, loss of consciousness. What, uh, what crime has been committed? Were they aiming for the head or the baseball? Oh, with aiming for the head of the baseball. Precisely. I haven't given you enough facts. Because if it turns out they were aiming for the baseball, 
we have no crime at all. Now, think about this for a second. The welt, the concussion, the loss of consciousness, none of that has changed. So what has changed? Well, on the one hand, the responsibility of the actor certainly has changed because we've gone from an intentional infliction of harm to, you know, negligence or maybe not even. Maybe the catcher was standing too close. So maybe it's not even negligent, really. That's one thing that's changed. But another thing that's changed is the actual harm to the victim. You know, Oliver Wendell Holmes, great Supreme Court Justice, famously said, even a dog knows the difference between being tripped over and being kicked. <laughs> as do we. The, the, the actual harm, the sense of affront, as opposed to the sense of an accident, even a terrible accident, even a tragic accident, the harm is very different. So we ask all the time, what was the actor intending? Sometimes it's easy to tell, sometimes it's hard to tell, but it's not always hard to tell. Sometimes it's not hard to tell. So, coming back to our expression context, we might ask, what was this expressor, speaker in most of these cases, intending to accomplish? Was it an intent to communicate a view, albeit a provocative view, albeit a troublesome view, albeit, yes, even a hateful view? Or was it an intent to threaten? Not in some general sense, but a focused intent to threaten one individual, to instill fear in somebody, what we might call a verbal assault, which the law recognizes. You don't need physical contact to commit an assault. Think about it for a second. You can think of examples or close to it even in your own life, I suspect, where words alone can be assaulted. Targeted at one person trying to intimidate that person, or an intent to disrupt rather than to communicate. All right, that sounds promising. Let's try a couple of examples of that. This is a line that the Supreme Court actually adopted in a case some years later called Virginia Against Black. Virginia Against Black is also a cross-burning statute case involving the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia's cross-burning law that said that Assaults committed with racial motivation shall receive a higher level of penalty. Okay, that we know is okay. That's the, that's, that Wisconsin against Mitchell case, that's okay. And then it went on to say that an assault that's committed using a burning cross shall be presumed to have racial motivation. Ah, there the court said, nah, you went too far. That's a bridge too far. The court said sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Sometimes the burning cross may be used as evidence of racial motivation, but sometimes it won't. And here are the two cases that were involved in Virginia against black. The court consolidated the two. One is probably the kind of case you're thinking about when you think about a hate crime. Black neighbor, white neighbor, white neighbor had been traumatizing the black family since they moved into the neighborhood, and by the time this whole set of behavior, including using a, a rifle to use the back garden as a firing range, uh, had worked its way through, they burned a cross on the lawn of the black family. They were charged with a hate crime, bias-motivated violence, using a, a uh, burning cross as in the commission of that. Supreme Court upheld that as a hate crime law and I think pro a hate crime prosecution, I think properly so. The other was a Ku Klux Klan rally, at the conclusion of which the Klan's members lit a 25-foot cross on fire. They did so in order to communicate and express their views. Now let's be clear, their views are views of white supremacy. And I think we need no great reminder anymore in the times in which we're living. The challenges and the danger of such views effectuating. But we live in a society that protects expression. And so the court said expressing those views is protected. If you change the context, Instead of a Klan rally, if the Klan rally is across the street from an AME Baptist church, let's say, now we've changed everything, right? Then it looks more like what happened in the other case. So all contextual. But the contextual question is what did the actor intend? Now let's take a case on campus, one I was actually involved in. Uh, not as a president, not as a dean. Uh, but when I was, uh, when I was at a, uh, as a dean at George Washington Law School, uh, I was privileged to serve as a trustee at my college, Williams College in Northwestern Massachusetts. 
I got a call from the president of the college. He said, terrible thing happened last night or this morning at the college, and I just got a call from a very upset student. I got a call from a young woman who is the president of the Williams College Jewish Association. She woke up this morning to find on her door a poster that said, you must evacuate your room by 5 o'clock this afternoon. All of your possessions will be taken out. Everything in here will be destroyed. You may not stay beyond 5 o'clock. This was a sign that was meant to resonate with or ape the posters, signs that the Israeli Defense Forces put on the homes of Palestinian families when a member of the family has been accused of terrorism before they destroy the home. She felt she'd been singled out. She felt she'd been traumatized. What can we do about it, the president said to me. So we had a little discussion about Virginia against black and about the intent of the actors. And he listened politely. And then he said, hey, Fred, this is great for one of your articles, but what am I supposed to do with this student who I'm supposed to call back in an hour? And I said, well, you might try the following. Find out how many of these posters were put up. Was it just one on the door of a student known to be the president of the school Jewish Association? If so, you may very well have a racially motivated attack of some sort on your hands, and you might want to think about how you want to deal with that. Or if, as turned out to be the case, there were posters put on every one of the doors in this entire dormitory, about 400. In which case, what you pretty clearly have is an expression of a deeply held view on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, you may think the way they express those views are particularly inept and poor. Or you may think the way they expressed them is actually pretty effective and good. And you may agree with their views, or you may disagree with their views. That's not the point. The point is what they were doing was expressing their deeply held views. And therefore, the question is not how did the student respond to that. We'll come back to that in a second because there are things that still have to be attended to. But in terms of can we do something to these students, should they be sanctioned, should they be disciplined, not for expressing views, as opposed to threatening, intimidating a particular student by design, by purpose. And so that's our second principle, that we presume that speech is protected. That's our first principle, and that the limits are all the way out on the horizons where we have an intent to intimidate, an intent to threaten, an intent to disrupt. And if that's all there were to it, then I would have called this talk free speech on campus. It's pretty complicated. <laughs> but that's not what it's called. It's called free speech on campus. It's complicated. Because determining what speech to protect and what not to protect is a very important threshold question. But it is only the threshold question. Because now we come to the question of how should we as a community respond to certain kinds of expression even after it is protected. Two lessons that come to me years apart that help focus my thinking on this. The first is an article by an art critic of all people. There's that liberal arts stuff again. Some of you may remember uh, or have heard of an exhibition at the Cincinnati Art Museum by the artist Robert Maplethorpe. Now, Maplethorpe stuff is not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, whether you like it or not depends on just how edgy you like your art. So if you're the kind of person who does not like pictures of, oh, I don't know, crucifixes dipped in urine, you may decide it's not your stuff. So Maplethorpe stuff is pretty edgy, and a lot of people find it very difficult including the, good, the great and the good of Cincinnati, who shut it down. Whereupon Maplethorpe brought a lawsuit, and you can guess what happened. Federal court said, under the First Amendment, can't shut it down, can't repress expression, got to reopen the exhibition. Art critic by the name of Robert Hughes wrote a wonderful little essay in which he said, Hughes, I should mention, is Australian, which is relevant for our purposes. He's not American. He says, Americans have a tendency to constitutionalize all important issues as if the only important question is, is this protected, is it not protected? He said, I don't find that issue so important. He said, to me, the important thing is the aesthetic question. Of course it's protected, he said. 
The question is, now that we've said it's protected, when do we get to the aesthetic question? He then went on to compliment some of it and take some of it apart and say he thought some of it was junk. I'm not professionally equipped to evaluate Hughes's analysis, so I have to say as an amateur uh, art uh, lover, um, I found his argument to be persuasive. His real point to me was that by focusing only on the constitutional question, we never get to the aesthetic question. We sort of, we stop that from happening as if the only interesting question is, is it protected, is it not protected? Now, fast forward to the last year. I was on the campus of Trinity College outside of Hartford where they had had a major free expression challenge. And I had a conversation with a group of students the next morning after my, we did a talk like this, uh, and then the next morning a group of students and I had breakfast together. One student who had inadvertently, uh, I shouldn't say un inadvertently, unintentionally become the leader of the African American student bodies, he said to me, it's not what I came here to do, I came here to study political science. Very bright, very charismatic young man and he, he got this position whether he wanted it or not because people were looking to him to play a leadership role. What would you say, he said to me, if Richard Spencer, well-known white supremacist, wanted to speak at Trinity? I said, well, if he were invited to this campus, then for the reasons I just talked about with all of you, um, I said, unless he's intending to threaten people, if he's putting up you know, blow-ups of certain students and targeting them, that's something different. But if he's expressing his views, hateful or otherwise, I think that's protected. He listened, he nodded, he said, okay. He said, well, I'll tell you what. The day Richard Spencer speaks here is the day I put in my papers to transfer from this college. Because this is my home. I don't want him in my home. Now I have to tell you, he didn't persuade me that Richard Spencer's right to speak should not be upheld. But he's kept me up many nights since that conversation. And here's what I learned from him in that conversation. Free speech, free expression, exacts a cost on the community. For all the reasons I've been talking about, it is a cost I believe is worth bearing. I believe it is worth bearing on an arts and sciences campus. I believe it is worth bearing in a community, in a self-governing free society. But we must never forget that that is not a cost that is borne equally by all members of the community. It is a cost that falls disproportionately on some members of the community. I still do not believe that is an argument for repressing speech, but I do believe it creates a moral obligation on behalf of our institutions to respond to certain kinds of speech. You know, when these events happen on campuses, typically people say things like, that's, that's not us. I mean, think about Pittsburgh, right? This isn't us. This is not who we are. And that's good. They should feel that way. But it's not even half of the story. I know you're not that. Who are you? What are you? This is the time for the community not just to denounce, but to announce what it is. And so there is a moral obligation, I believe, to speak out from leadership, from presidents and provosts, from student leaders, from all members of the community. Now look, make no mistake about it, a wise president, and you have a wise president, does not want to get in the business of calling First Amendment balls and strikes on a daily basis. First of all, it debases the currency of the kind of announcements that he wants to be able to make from time to time. But also, the goal is not for this conversation to be dropped from on high. It is precisely for this conversation to come from the community. The role of leadership is to pick your spots. And I regret to say, if you're president, a provost of a university for some length of time these days, you'll get your spot. To pick your spots carefully, to weigh in, to say, this is what we stand for. You know, I shouldn't say this with Ed sitting here, but why not? What all presidents know, I know this from my time and you know this here, it's not really clear what we do, you know? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, really, these, these places kind of run themselves, you know? The faculty in their labs, in their classrooms, in their seminar rooms, in their offices, on the playing fields, in the studios, in the courts, in the gyms. The places kind of run themselves. So what is it the president does uniquely? 
The president gets to say, we stand for this. The president gets to say, we're about this, and make it stick. And that's a very powerful, I might even say, in a public institution, a sacred responsibility. So you pick your spots, and you can do it seriously sometimes, and you can do it with humor others. Let me give you a good example. University of Florida, Richard Spencer did come to speak, some of you may have read. President of University of Florida provided for him to speak, saying First Amendment rights apply here on our campus, but he also made very clear in his own remarks prior to the visit that the University of Florida has values, and they include dignity and decency and diversity and inclusion, and that Richard Spencer runs afoul of every one of those values, and that he may speak here because we believe in free expression, but we have values too, and he expressed those clearly. He also took a little bit of that money out of a president's discretionary budget, the presidents have, and he threw a hell of a good event at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, don't forget the role of humor. There was a campus pub in Gainesville that put out a notice that for anybody who showed up with two unused tickets to the Spencer event, they get a free pitcher of beer. <laughs> Turns out there's a First Amendment right to speak, but there's no First Amendment right to have anybody show up to listen to you. The point is that, as my great hero, Louis Brandeis, Supreme Court Justice, wrote, in the absence of incitement of imminent lawless activity, the answer to bad speech is not enforced silence, it's more speech. And I would say, as a friendly amendment to Justice Brandeis, that what was a legal formula a hundred years ago today has become a moral obligation. There is a moral obligation to speak out and to be heard and to practice what I like to call the art of vigorous civility. Let me conclude with my three principles of vigorous civility. Now, I use the term vigorous civility on purpose. It's designed to sound a little bit like an oxymoron. It's not. There is nothing weak or th analytically thin about being civil to one another. Nor is there anything uncivil about vigorous debate. I think civility has gotten a bad name as being an argument for repressing speech on the one hand or an argument for evading, avoiding serious dialogue on the other. Ed said at the beginning the need for a community to be able to, to argue, to disagree, disagree in a constructive way. This is what I mean by vigorous civility. So let me give you my three principles of vigorous civility. Number one, that we disagree with each other without delegitimizing each other. Disagreement is actually, perhaps paradoxically, community building. When I disagree with you, I have to listen to your views. I think about what you're saying, and I hope you're listening to me. And we argue, but we actually are engaged in a dialogue when we do that. That is actually community building. When I delegitimize you, I'm saying you have no place in this discussion. You have no place at this table. Your views are irrelevant. You don't belong here. That's what it means to delegitimize. That is community destroying. So we must begin by disagreeing without delegitimizing. Second, which is related, we at least begin difficult conversations by questioning each other's ideas and not each other's motives. It is all too easy to begin by, I know why you're saying that, and then what does that mean? That means I don't have to engage with your ideas because I question your motives. Now look, let's not be naive here. There are times when we do right to question people's motives. Within the community, highly unlikely. You know, even the people you disagree with, they're unlikely to wake up in the morning and say, oh, today's the day I get to screw up Western. That's not what people want to do. You, by and large, have the best interest of the university in mind. It may not be your idea what's in the best interest of the university, but by and large, that's what people have in mind, so we don't question their motives. Now, you know, courtesy of, of the wonderful world in which we're living, you know, there's no such thing as keeping a conversation just on campus. Everything goes all over. Everything can go viral. You got people who will weigh in in a conversation who could not find this university on a map. Well, you might do well to question their motives. 
they may not have the best interest of the university in mind. But my point is, in difficult conversations, we at least begin by not questioning each other's motives, but by questioning each other's ideas. Finally, what will sound like the simplest, but in some ways is the hardest. In difficult conversations, we make as part of the conversation a forced exercise of a search for common ground. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. I don't mean that we just take it up to such a high level of abstraction that we all kind of agree because we're talking about, you know, fleecy clouds and white doves. I mean a real exercise of where do we disagree but where do we agree. I'll give you an example from my own life. I told you earlier that I was involved in the hate crimes project during the 1980s, 1990s. Um, and my book on hate crimes came out in the late 1990s. Uh, there were people who were writing books at the same time taking a very different view, as I said, saying that hate crimes are punishing thought, not crimes, and therefore are unconstitutional. And we debated each other endlessly in a number of different forums, and we sold a lot of books for each other, so it actually worked out rather well for everybody concerned. Um, a couple of years after that, one of my intellectual protagonists and I were each invited to speak at a symposium at Harvard Law School that was going to be published in the Harvard Journal of Legislation on the subject of hate crime legislation. And this symposium was also going to lead to written papers. Now, at this point, I really felt as if I'd written what I wanted to say about this topic. And the thought of writing another paper was not that attractive. Not to mention the fact that we debated each other so much that by this point, I thought, you know, I could write Susan's paper and she could write my paper. And then something amazing happened. I read an op-ed in the New York Times that was co-authored by a pro-life advocate and a pro-choice advocate. And they said, we fundamentally disagree on the core issue of abortion rights. One of us believes that life begins at conception. She believes that abortion is murder. The other of us believes that abortion is fundamentally about a woman's right to choose and to control her own reproductive freedom and the use of her body. We will not agree on that issue. We wanted to see if there were 800 words on which we could agree. And they wrote a really interesting, compelling op-ed about adoption and adoption laws and barriers to adoption, about health care, particularly reproductive health care, to young women, particularly young women in underserved communities. Very powerful piece, I thought. So I called Susan the next morning. I said, hey, did you see the piece in the time? She said, yeah. I said, why don't we do that? Why don't we see if we can write 5,000 words in which we agree? And I will not try to persuade you that bias crimes are a fully constitutional way of enhancing the punishment for a more serious crime, even though I'm right. <laughs> and you will not try to persuade me that bias crime laws are unconstitutional, because you're wrong. Um, <laughs> and, and let's see what we can do. And I must tell you, it is my favorite article that I wrote. Not the one that got cited the most, not the one that got read the most, but my favorite, because it, it stretched me. It forced me to really put myself in somebody else's shoes and really see where she was and where we could make joint cause. And you know, it actually was more successful than we thought. We actually wound up concocting a, a, a model hate crime statute that we could agree on. I mean, it was a clunky thing that no state legislature would ever adopt. That wasn't the point point of the exercise was to see where there was common ground. So that's what I mean in a hard conversation, to really force yourself to say, what are the pieces we agree on before you go on to the pieces you disagree on? We have a paucity of models of vigorous civility in the time in which we're living. So let me leave you with a good one. It involves my mentor from law school, a man named Charles Black, who was one of the giants of constitutional law in the mid-late 20th century. He was very involved in the line of cases that ultimately culminated in Brown against Board of Education. He worked very closely with the great Thurgood Marshall and others in the NAACP Legal Defense Fund team. And he was involved in the years that followed, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the case for judicial activism for courts to play a role in expanding uh, civil rights and equality rights and the rights of criminal defendants and, yes, reproductive rights. Um, his intellectual sparring partner was a man named Alexander Bickel. Bickle believed in what he called the passive virtues of the court. He believed in judicial restraint. He thought courts should do less, forcing legislatures to do more. He was against judicial activism. And they debated endlessly uh, in press, in media, in scholarship, at conferences, until Bickle was taken from us far too young. He died of a 
horrible, debilitating disease. And as he was suffering and wasting away, Black continued to hammer away at him in scholarship, leading some people to say, how can you do that? And he said, I owe it to him. I won't patronize him by not taking his ideas seriously, even now as he's dying, especially now as he's dying. When Bickle died, Black wrote an essay in memory of his friend in which he said, Bickle and I agreed on everything except for our opinions. <laughs> it's as loving a statement of vigorous civility as I know. If we have lost the ability to say that we, to another, agree on everything except for our opinions, then we have lost something very precious and quite possibly irreplaceable. But if we can maintain and regain that ability to say that I agree with you on everything but your opinions, then we have recaptured what is at the very essence of the great liberal arts university. And that is at the very essence of what those five undergraduates had in mind on the cold winter night of December 5th, 1776 when they committed themselves to the notion that it would be the love of learning, no dogma, but the love of learning, of shared learning, of disagreeing respectfully. That love of learning, that would be the guide, the pilot of their lives. Thank you. We have a little time for questions, a couple anyway. Please. Yes, I, I'm curious that you didn't mention a really key issue that came before you was President Brandeis. And that is, I wonder if you could share with us all how it is that you handled the personality. Sure. What you think about it now, if, if you're any different, or maybe share with folks who don't know about it or something. Yeah, sure. Um, the, uh, the, the question concerns uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, um, who was to have uh, received an honorary degree. Uh, contrary to what actually many, including uh, she herself wrote, uh, not to be a speaker. The commencement speaker uh, actually had been chosen two years earlier, and it was not she. Um, but the, um, the uh, uh, actually the speaker was Jeffrey Canada from the, Harvard, um, the Harlem Children's Project. But she was to receive an honorary degree. Um, at the time that she was selected, uh, the committee that recommended it, and I in approving it, uh, was unaware of um, many statements that she had made uh, that were particularly uh, delegitimizing to, uh, uh, to Islam and to Muslims. Um, to make as clear as possible that this was not a question about speech, this was a question about uh, honoring at a commencement, which although not literally a required attendance event, is essentially, a, 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 I shouldn't say it's a requirement, is that everyone should have the ability, the right to attend a commencement without having to worry about what they're going to hear. Um, there was an open invitation that was made both privately, me to her personally, uh, and also quite publicly in the, in the newspapers, uh, that she could speak on campus anytime, anywhere. Uh, I'd host it, I'd be there. Um, so it was not about speech, but it was about honoring uh, at a particular occasion. So um, it, it was a difficult decision um, in large measure because it caused some embarrassment to her, it caused some embarrassment to the university. Uh, my personal uh, conversation with her uh, certainly made my apology for whatever uh, apologies, uh, whatever um, embarrassment there was to her, um, and certainly what happened to the university is my responsibility. Uh, but that was the reason for the decision uh, to uh, not to give her an honorary degree, uh, but as I say, to make the campus available to her to, to speak. Can I just follow up with another question? Sure. So how does one discern the difference between disagreeing and delegitimizing? Because to some of us who are great admirers of her courage, Right. Out against, um, Islam well, and just to be clear, you know, again, I, not to the point of saying she wouldn't get a platform. She certainly could speak. So this this does not go into the analysis of whether one could speak or not. No problem with her speaking. In terms of being honored in that particular format, I, I think it was comments such as um, uh, Islam has to be crushed. And when she was asked, 
you don't mean all Islam, you mean Islamic extremism. Uh, and she said, no, I mean all Islam. It has to be crushed and something new has to be built on it. Um, I think the best way to, to think that one through is that if that had been said about any other religion um, in sort of the Western canon, uh, I think there would have been an uproar about such a person being honored. So that's, that's the reason behind that. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Make things get more complicated. Please. Sure. Uh, we have almost 2,000 foreign students at this university, uh, coming from various you know, countries in the world with various relationships to free speech. Just uh, be interested in your reflections on what obligation any American university has to its foreign students regarding protection of their free speech while they're here and then after. Um, wow, that's a, it's an interesting and complicated set of questions because in fact, you know, much of the, and certainly now, let, let's you know, stay within the, within the ambit of the First Amendment. Uh, we are fairly different from most other countries, um, including um, liberal democracies in terms of uh, broad, robust protection of speech. I mean, places with legal systems as relatively close to our own as Canada, uh, the UK, uh, Germany, France, take very different views uh, and actually will pro prohibit um, hate speech, not just the hate speech that I would prohibit in terms of that which targets, but even speech that, uh, that, that attacks a group or that defames a group. So uh, those are very different legal cultures. Um, and I have to say, I am not a, um, an, an, an American uh, uh, legal triumphalist. I think ours is a system that serves our country well. Um, it may not serve uh, all others well. I'll, I'll give you the best example of this. I, I spoke at a conference um, in Jerusalem, actually, shortly after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, the scholars uh, were Brits, Americans, Germans, and Israelis. Perhaps not so surprisingly, the Israelis and the Germans are the ones who agreed most with each other because those are the two legal systems that have grown up in the shadow of the Holocaust. Both were quite prepared to restrict all sorts of uh, uh, violence conducive speech, which was the question after the, uh, the Rabin assassination. Uh, the British less so, and I guess I almost least of all, uh, the late Anthony Lewis was on that panel, who probably was you know, further to the pro-speech side than I. So that was sort of the, the, the panoply. But after I spoke, uh, one of my German colleagues on the panel said to me, um, you know, your views about free expression, I bet you wouldn't feel that way uh, if, if there were uh, uh, brown shirts marching up and down Fifth Avenue throughout the 1930s and 40s, and if you'd lived through uh, Nazi totalitarianism. You know, in, in Germany, it's illegal to this day to fly a swastika. Uh, in the United States, it is most certainly legal to fly a swastika. Again, depending on the context, right? If you use it to threaten somebody, that's different. But uh, hanging it outside your home, perfectly legal. Um, he said to me, if you'd lived through that, you probably have a different view of the First Amendment, and I think he's absolutely right. I think it is highly contextual in that sense. So I think that we, as part of educating our students, we bring our international students to, uh, to this country and to our legal culture and our social culture, and we expose them to that, and we learn from them at the same time. Um, when they go back to their home countries, they obviously are, uh, uh, are, are subject to the, to the laws and norms then. The last piece of it, though, and in some ways maybe the most troubling, is that not all of these norms are ones that I would say are only American. Some of them, I think, are trans-contextual. And so a basic respect for the value of human expression, perhaps more limited than it is here, is still fundamental. So were it my alum, alumnus uh, in another country uh, whose ability to engage in basic right of human expression, not the American First Amendment right, but a basic human right, I, I think as a president I'd be inclined to speak out on that. I think that did it. Um, I gather there's a reception <laughs> afterwards. Reception. Be happy to do some one-on-one -on -one talk afterwards, um, but, but thank you all for your attention and good luck to you.